Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial and the co-host of the Michelle Miao Show here at the club. We hope you are staying safe and are well wherever you are. And we look forward to seeing you in person someday in the future at the Commonwealth Club's headquarters in San Francisco. Until that happens, we are doing all of our programming online. Uh, this is in fact the latest in more than 200 online programs the club has produced in the past five or six months. You can find all of our upcoming programs as well as audio and video from our past programs and information for how you can help support our program production at commonwealthclub.org. If you're watching us live on YouTube or Facebook, you can use the chat function to post questions for our special guests today and we'll work some of them into our conversation. Now I'd like to introduce Michelle Miao, a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors and the longtime producer and host of The Michelle Miao Show. Good to see you again, Michelle. Thank you so much, John. Thank you to the club and all of you for joining us. And like John said, we want you engaged in the conversation. So send us questions or comments um, and we'll get them to our special guests. Now I'd like to introduce you to our guest, Laura Flanders, an Izzy Award-winning independent journalist, a New York Times bestselling author, and the recipient of the Pat Mitchell Lifetime Achievement Award from the Women's Media Center. My personal Shiro, actually. Um, <laughs> She recently just launched her new The Laura Flanders Show on public television stations this month, actually. And uh, we actually we have a, a cool, neat trailer that we'll play right now. Society is changing fast and seems to be coming apart. But could we come out of this stronger with a better democracy and a healthier world? On The Laura Flanders Show, I report on the people and practices driving change today. From mind-shifting art to growing local food to new ways of banking, working and governing ourselves. From around the world to your backyard, join me, Laura Flanders, for an exploration of what's possible. And let's welcome Laura Flanders to the program. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Michelle. Hey, John. Great to be with you. I wish we could all be together in San Francisco. And my heart goes out to all of you in California right now as you inhale and look at those fires. Yeah, yeah, we are going through it. Uh, but glad that the fog has rolled in this, this morning. And so I think that's good news um, and probably good energy since we're doing this show together and we're, we're on uh, at least virtually here in the same room. Um, Laura, it is tradition here on the program that we ask for our guests to share either a coming out story or, you know, kind of, you know, however that sits with you. And so we'll go ahead and ask you your coming out story. Well, which do you want me to talk about? The coming out as a left person, the coming out as independent media, the coming out as a lesbian, I don't know, the coming out as the child of a person with disabilities. I don't know about you, Michelle, but I've had sort of successive comings out over my lifetime. But I think the one you're getting at is coming out as a lesbian. I mean, I, I think I came out as a radical before that. Um, but in my early 20s, I was, would say, or maybe 18, 19, somewhere in there, I moved to the United States um, and to New York. I was only supposed to be here for six months. Sorry, mom. Um, stayed till now. This was about 1980, 1980, 81. And I think I came out in that first year of college, like so many of us do. In my case, it was in the heart of a um, women and lesbian led movement around nuclear nonproliferation. Um, a peace movement uh, that looked at the intersection forces of patriarchy and capitalism and colonialism and heteropatriarchy. And um, I, it was in that period and in the ferment of that beautiful movement that I started falling in love and, and acting on it. Yum. John. Well, I, that, I actually want to get into that a bit, as well as the, you mentioned kind of you're coming out as a radical or whatever, because um, talk about some of the formative, some of the things that formed you or, or the, the things that were going on that made you or had your views always kind of been, even as a 
kid kind of. Well, you know, I came from a family of, of journalists and performers, and in a way I feel like I kind of blended the two. And the journalists were independent, activist-minded journalists on the left. My grandfather reported from the Spanish Civil War and um, from the United States in the 1930s. Uh, he had his own independent newsletter, and my uncle, Alexander Coben, did the same. And I sometimes think I'm the least radical person in the world because I've <laughs> followed the family tradition um, so assiduously. Uh, but I think I was always attracted to the idea of being at the front line or, you know, watching history happen and following the movements that made that shift in history that we live through. Um, and I think that I was always conscious that I was attracted to where the change makers were um, and where people were grappling with some of the fundamental questions. And let's face it, I mean, you know, the wonderful uh, queer theorist and activist Amber Hollabaugh always talks about how our personal desires drive our political work um, because we aspire to a to a love that's not necessarily visible in the world, in our personal lives, and in a sense in the bigger world, a desire to make possible the unseen um, is sort of inward out. And, and I think that was also affirmed for me by the wonderful poet and massively missed um, Bay Area resident, June Jordan, who also talked about being directed by desire in her political work, in her personal life, um, I had the incredible honor and, and joy of being close with June in her last years of life. And I'm inspired by thinking about her and her passion for change and for people making change and for possibility. Uh, definitely a huge influence. And personally, um, especially in the last four years, I've learned that the, the change is the constant. And I'd always you know, once thought that you, you make the change, then you hope that the change happens, and then you, know, you hang up your, your hat because the work is done. But I'm realizing that the work is never done, which you, know, you can probably um, attest to considering that the show that you have produced, the change makers that you've uh, interviewed, the work that you have witnessed, you know, is, has evolved to where we're at today. And it never there, there never was a point, I don't think, in your own career that you thought that the, the work, you know, is done. And, well, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a very fundamentally kind of American and um, maybe it's kind of a consumerist approach to change making, to think that we'll go out and buy it the day after tomorrow or, or we'll make it the week after next. Uh, if you speak to particularly indigenous activists, I had a chance with the wonderful organization Madre to travel around Central America at the end of the 1980s, at the end of the Central American wars. And the activists there, I remember from Guatemala, you know, just as so many indigenous people do on this, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere, there they, they talked about the seven generations after them, or if they could just contribute to change that would affect the lives of their great grandchildren they'd be happy. Uh, and I think that has to be our approach to change. It's certainly mine at this point, because I don't know about you, but the change I expected is really not on time. Uh, and I think we have to learn to remember that it took many decades and centuries for us to come here. This reality that we're in now was not always this way, and that it will probably take many more uh, to go where we would hope that we can go as a society. And our names may not be on that ultimate product, um, like so many, you know, billionaires put their names on the building. You know, that's probably not going to be the case for us. Here's the movement that Michelle made. Probably not. But you'll have your legacy. It's okay. <laughs> well, so, I mean, just talking about that, how things are certainly not going in frankly, a very good direction in many ways. Um, are you, would you call yourself an optimist? I mean, you, you've lived through Thatcher and Reagan and, and then George W. and, and uh, uh, now Boris Johnson and, and of course, Donald Trump. Um, yeah. As someone of the left, I mean, don't, do, you, do you see things getting actually worse or it's all one of the same bad? Well, you know, Gram I always say, you know, I remember what, you know, the Italian philosopher Gramsci said about, you know, optimism, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Um, but I also remember what the Texan philosopher and humorist Molly Ivan said, which is you better relish today because in the future you'll look back and these are the good old days. So, you know, 
I don't know whether that means I'm an optimist exactly, but I do remember actually with June um, standing maybe at a beach in Marin or something. And you know how you go to the most beautiful place in the world in California and you are looking out at this gorgeous scene and then there's this big sign warning you of all the threats to your life that are also present in that moment. The sharks, the undertow, the riptide, you are probably going to die, um, but you're also in the most gorgeous place. Uh, and I remember having this conversation about June, like with June, about what motivates people more. Is it the sort of fear and fright of um, impending doom? Or is it the the passion for the possible and, and um, you know, Molly's approach of, of relishing uh, having a chance? Uh, and you know what? You got to go with relishing having a chance, I think. Um, otherwise, life would be pretty grim. Uh, and as far as have we made progress It really depends on how you look at the statistics. I mean, if you look globally, you'd have to say actually global poverty has decreased in our lifetimes. Sure. But if you also look globally, you have to say that the concentration of wealth has increased in our lifetime. So the rational kind of way to conform those two is we shouldn't even be having poverty anymore. If we distributed the resources we have as a planet more fairly Everybody could have been lifted, not just out of poverty, um, but well into what people call the middle class. But I think we mean a, a quality of life that's worth living. And if ever there was a time for looking at how we got here, and again, this situation, this economy, this environmental catastrophe hasn't been with us forever. It's mutable. We played a role. Um If we look at the moment that we're in now of global pandemic, climate change, fueled fires, storms in the Gulf, the like of which we've never seen, um, you have to say this is the moment we make change or crash. Um, Because whether we're talking the environment and biodiversity or simply human survival in a post-pandemic economy, we got to change our priorities. So we better seize this moment. And I do come down on the side of June that you motivate people with passion for possibility better than those scary signs about sharks. Mm -hmm. Talking about motivating people, I think, you know, obviously it's a different time. It's a different world. Social media has given us this opportunity to access information, whether it's misinformation, disinformation, or true actual facts um, in real time, very fast. And, and, and in, in ways, you know, these very extreme um, impacts in a good way, in a bad way, I'd love to hear, you know, your thoughts, especially as a member of uh, independent media, um, uh, an independent journalist. And, you know, personally, I feel the independent folks are under extreme attack in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's a very dangerous time for, for um, members of, the, of independent media uh, and kind of how not me again, not so focused on U.S. politics, but just how the, the times have changed. And, and now with all of the issues that we're facing today, how that might have impacted, you know, you as a member of independent media. Yeah. Well, the first thing I always say is I think journalists often worry too much about our own safety and welfare and not enough about the people that we're reporting on. So our crisis is never the number one or I never feel like my crisis is the number one priority. Um, I want to be able to keep doing the reporting that I'm doing. And in terms of how the change in technology in the media landscape has affected me personally, I'll say that, you know, when I started out in the 1980s, I was 12, of course, um, and I had a little uh, Super 8 camera and I was on the streets of Belfast, Northern Ireland, where there happened to be a war happening, but nobody was talking about it. And the British uh, back in London called it the Troubles. Um, and to get a story out from there was not easy. You know, if you weren't working with a newspaper, if you weren't working with a media outlet, it wasn't hard. It wasn't easy to get your story heard. I was lucky enough to know that there was a community supported radio station in New York, WBAI, part of the Pacifica network that uh, KPFA in your backyard is a member of. Uh, And it was possible for me on the occasion where I actually saw someone be shot right in front of me um, to make a phone call and say, this is what I just saw. 
Uh, and they didn't say, well, but where's your journalism degree? And will you help our fund? You know, will you will you bring advertising support? Um, they just put me on the air. And that's why we have to support our local independent media, especially our community supported, um, you know, radio and television. So if you haven't paid your pledge, pay your pledge. Um, but today it's much easier to get your story out. You know, we can have an, our own platform. We can raise our own funds. Uh, we can find that niche audience that's interested in what we're doing. Uh, I always say, you know, it's the, it's the best time in the world to get your story out. It's the hardest time in the world to get paid. I mean, media, just like every other industry, has opened an enormous chasm between the handful that have and earn millions of dollars, heavily supported by massive global corporations with a direct interest in selling you war and disease, um, and everyone else who struggles to get by. And if they're not going to sell their soul to the closest drug pusher, um, has a pretty hard time. So I'm in, I feel incredibly privileged that I've managed to hop from initiative to initiative, whether it was Working Assets Radio there in the Bay Area, KALW, um, Free Speech TV, Air America Radio. I've I've been in the right place, often at the right time with the right background um, and, and willingness. Um, but what makes me sad is I don't look back and feel like I've created a very effective funnel for other people uh, because it's not like we've created institutions that pay great living wages to up-and-coming journalists. We've created barely surviving institutions that give people great opportunities to hone their skills um, if they can get by somewhere on a pittance. Like, like you, I, I uh, grew up with parents in the media, in my case, uh, newspapers and magazines. My stepfather and my mother, both editors and, and political cartoonists in the case of my stepfather. Um, and of course, magazines as an industry have largely gone out of existence newspapers are dead men walking you know um and so what you're talking about there about you know the ability to actually have an institution or a place where you can earn a decent living um you could have a career you know is, is, is has kind of gone away it's going kind of 90 degrees here we what we have now is of course a lot of the social media um either creating or or spreading um news, news in quotes, um, and, and of course, just flat out, you know, propaganda yeah. and, and misinformation. How do you get your, because when be, if people have not seen the Laura Flanders show, check it out, it's intelligent conversation. And how do you get above the noise of QAnon and, and others? Well, you've raised lots of great topics there. Um, and the, just the to talk about newspapers, today, just to talk about newspapers for a second, I mean, it is, it's important what you said about social media spreading stories. And let's just talk about actual reported stories for a minute before we get into conspiracies and, and uh, lies. Uh, but they do spread, the, the most far spreading stories in social media continue to be those that have usually been paid for by some newspaper or media outlet that has invested some resources in a reporter or team of reporters who've dug for facts. Um, so let's not forget that at the core of many of our most critical stories of this time, um, we have reporters who've had the resources to spend a long time doing reporting, to have a legal team at their back in case they say something that upsets someone, which we hope they will, um, and to um, get their story out, having had it be che fact-checked and resourced in a way that defends them from, from easy mistakes and, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the power of that kind of reporting continues to be all important in journalism. And what we try to do within Reason is to do our own original reporting. Uh, this week's show, the one that's airing right now, is all about the experience of Spain under dictatorship in the 20th century, the dictatorship of Francisco Franco, and what people there did under dictatorship to survive. 
And I literally got a chance to go and look at the legacy of the cooperative economic network that grew up under Franco in the Basque region and exists today in the world's largest worker-owned co-ops, and in Barcelona at the solidarity economy practices that are embedded today in city government uh, as that Barcelona in Comun movement pulls together a, a lot of pre-existing threads of solidarity economics that date right back to the Civil War times. So, you know, they, you, you'll see me, you know, going to places and talking to people. Uh, and this week's show is, again, a reported show, the one that launches on Sunday, this coming Sunday, is a reported show from Newark, New Jersey, where we look at something called the Community Street Team that is bringing a public first and public safety first approach to policing. Uh, and public safety is defined very much as having people who have experienced the harm of the economy and of violence at the table uh, when it comes to both development and policing decisions. So we do a bunch of reporting. Um, but how do we step above the social media and sort of political cat, cat, fat, cat fight um, fest? We funded ourselves. We fund the show through independent support coming from foundations and individuals and audience. And that enables us. I don't walk out of the studio having to look at the ratings report. You know, did this subject turn the audience on enough? You know, the algorithms of social media encourage firefights. Uh, and negative, you know, contested facts and who's going to go to and fro this many times. It's not really about anything that has to do with public service, public good, truth, or what Michelle referred to as real actual facts. Um, I'm afraid our, our money mechanisms benefit mendacity, not to be too alliterative there. Um, and that's why we need not just individual programs like mine that survive by the skin of our teeth and thank you all of our supporters in the Bay Area and nationally, um, but also channels and platforms like public television, public radio that are community supported um, and not just community supported, but I would say state supported, publicly funded through the tax um, revenues of this society because having a commercial free place for public discussion and information sharing is a critical piece of our democracy. And, and we can't let that go, um, but we've been letting it go for the, my entire lifetime. I'm really interested to hear what you think about um, billionaires, tech billionaires, such as Mark Zuckerberg, you know, who uh, are head of a, a platform like Facebook and, you know, it's interesting to me when I think about what Facebook has done in this global pandemic, and you can see you know, their efforts in terms of putting out information out there or regulating what um, misinformation or disinformation as it pertains to COVID-19. And it all appears like this is good for us, but at the end of the day, you've got, you've got people with incredible amount of money, incredible amount of power who can say what is good news, what is bad news, what is news in general. What and is the news, exactly. Because, you know, I think many of us, especially uh, you're putting original content out there, we do rely on this thing, Facebook, social media, in order to fund ourselves or get our, the word out there. Um, but I haven't yet landed on, you know, something uh, as a conclusion and, and how I feel about big, billionaires owning our ability to express ourselves. So I'd love to hear. You know, oh, I think you have, Michelle. I, I suspect <laughs> you have landed on what you think about big billionaires owning your means of expressing yourself. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, we're always in a tough spot, those of us who are dependent on philanthropic dollars, because there's really no such thing as clean money. I admit it. Uh, we do our best to launder as, as, as well as we can. But it comes back to... I think the need actually still for public media and public ownership of some means of media production, not as an instead of, but as a both and. Because, you know, if you think about Facebook, that's one thing, but think about Amazon. Uh, Jeff Bezos owns media as well. The moment that we're in is a moment in which we have seen, you know, more people claim unemployment, more people uh, shoved into 
desperate poverty, more businesses on Main Street go broke. 75% of the businesses that were surveyed at the beginning of the year said they didn't have even enough to be out of business for one month. Well, they've most of them been out of business for six. We have w one in four of all the restaurants that have probably closed will not, re I think they say actually three out of four will, will not reopen. Um, the very same week that we saw, you know, 150,000 COVID deaths, uh, we saw the stock market hit a new height. And we saw billionaires like Bezos, he's in a group of U.S. billionaires who I think made $167 billion in this period. So you have this split happening in our society. Do we really, where the future could be one thing or another, it could very easily be a mass takeover of our economy, our ability to produce food, distribute food, sell food, profit off food, being in the hands of a few corporations, and Amazon would be one of them, with their own growing, their own warehousing, their own workers, and now their own trucks. Um, or a situation where we reinvest in community and perhaps use some public dollars to preserve some economic diversity on Main Street. Do we really want an Amazon-owned media outlet covering that question. I don't know about you, but I don't. So I don't mind if there is one. I just want to make sure that we have something else as well, where we can say bad things about Amazon without getting the, the plug pulled. Um, yesterday on the Bulwark podcast, Charlie Sykes, someone on, on the other end of the political spectrum from you, but he, of course, has been leading a very anti-Trump uh, media movement. And he was interviewing Charlotte Alter of Time magazine. And talking about you know misinformation and and uh, you know her interviews with people who have ju are just totally buying into crackpot theories and such, but they they kind of had a what to me was a very depressing point in the in the conversation where they were talking about a, this large chunk of Americans, most on the right but not exclusively, but large chunk of Americans who just are not reachable with an argument. Um, you know, Charlotte was talking about she did, did all this reporting from Wisconsin around Kenosha and other places she, and, you know, talking to people and, and tracking what she talked to each person about and later looking at it, she's like, not a single person there brought up Donald Trump's, you know, suckers and, and losers comment. Not a single one of them brought up uh, whatever his other bombshell scandal was. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 I think the, the, the Bob Woodward uh, tape thing. It's like that's utterly not in their world. Um, which to me, I guess, I, I tend to be a long-term optimist and maybe a short-term pessimist. That's kind of challenging my long-term optimism because you kind of hope that there's some accretive knowledge and, and education that goes on in society. And um, there certainly seem to be people who have managed to isolate themselves or yeah. who have been isolated from listening to someone they disagree with, but maybe starting to realize, oh, actually what she's saying makes sense, something like that. Where I'm taking all this is your audience that, that you're reaching. Um, are you are you hoping to uh, a who are they and b what are you hoping they get from your show and yeah. do? Well, we should say I should say that we produce not just a weekly show for public television, but also a podcast that goes out to and a radio show. So the radio show goes out to public radio stations and community radio stations and a couple of commercial radio stations um, through the PRX platform. Uh, all across the country. And radio is still a very good format for possibly catching people that are not the converted. You're changing the dial, pushing in different buttons. You might hear something that you hadn't heard. We also produce a YouTube program that people can find on YouTube through social media. And then we cut everything up into little shorts that we hope can infiltrate the social media kind of ecosphere. All of that being said, you know, I get points for trying. Um, is it effective? Probably, you know, only up to a point. This, the point that you're making, and one of the reasons, so the reason that we decided to uh, invest, frankly, in trying to get onto public television is we think one of our audiences are sort of well intentioned, progressive people, um, you know, believe in good things and being in favor of them and are against bad things, but they don't really know what to do, how to um, put any of their desires, wishes uh, into action. And they may think, 
I hope not, that all changes made in the White House uh, by our presidents or our senators, um, not much, they don't much, maybe know much about what's happening in their own backyard or at the grassroots level. So one of our audience, one of our intended audiences are, are good people looking for good ways to plug in and people who maybe are have an appetite for broadening their spectrum as to who are some of the heroes out there and some of the experts they could think about. Um, maybe they're the people that live right next door. So that's sort of our intended audience. And we hope to, you know, not just rabble rouse, but really give people um, information that they can act on about models that aren't just pie in the sky, but are in effect right here, right now, and could be a whole lot more effective if they had some more power behind them. The second point of your your question, though, makes me so sad that the Biden campaign appear not to be doing door knocking. I, forgive, forget, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is they're for swearing going door to door because of the pandemic. And I think this is a huge mistake. I think that with a mask, you can go door to door safely. And that when you're, you're the point that you made that's so important, as you said, they just the, the, the investigators you're, you've been hearing from are finding that people don't have these subjects in their world. Um, and the most effective door knocking that I've reported on isn't necessarily upfront partisan political, not rushing to the door and asking who you vote for, um, but rather the sort of canvassing that groups like Surge showing up for racial justice or the um, People's Action Campaign have done over the years, where they engage people at the doorstep in questions about what is in their lives. You know, what is what are you dealing with right now? Um, what challenges are you facing? How are your kids doing? What do you think of the food in this neighborhood? What would be your priority in this neighborhood? And from that, grassroots groups have developed effective, not just platforms, but plans of action that, you know, sometimes, and when they're good candidates, more often are adopted by political campaigns but in, can inform political campaigns and politicians at the local level so that they are speaking to things that are in people's lives rather than trying to get people in the middle of their daily life with their daily worries um, to stop and think about Biden v. Trump, which, let's face it, is not what most people want to eat for breakfast. You know, one of the things that uh, keep me up at night lately in, um, when we have these discussions with folks like yourself who seek the truth, who are actively working to make change a better tomorrow, leave the place a better tomorrow for others, is the, um, uh, yeah, I think I would say climate justice. I mean, we're, you mentioned at the top of the program, um, your thoughts are with us here in California as we experience wildfires and having the president come visit and having your governor, you know, he, our governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, try to have a very serious conversation about you know, what we need to be doing. And I think, I think that's the hardest part is when you politicize situations in which you know are, you, there's going to be an adverse impact like very soon. Like it's now, it's here, you know, yeah. um, and, and more people are going to die. And I don't know how to have a discussion or conversation, or maybe I do, but I acknowledge that it is difficult to, to maybe say it in a way in which we can have a much bigger conversation together without it being political. So climate justice keeps me up at night, the conversation around that. And then also around, you know, our, our freedom in general and this idea that uh, we're being pitted against each other, divided on, um, on something like protesting for our civil rights. So, mm -hmm. I, my, this was just a really also a long way of saying, hey, I'm sharing with you what keeps me up at night. Yeah, yeah. Someone like yourself who talks about you know, the change that we need to make on a daily basis. What is keeping you up at night? Gosh, long list. But I mean, it makes me think about a lot of things. You know, when we think about the climate crisis, Michelle, I, I think that we often wonder, you know, how are we going to persuade people of the science? You know, as if believing the science is the goal. You know, it's a boon, it's a plus. We do better when people believe scientists, um, but it's not a solution to our problem. So we need to shift the bar. Uh, there are solutions out there. Uh, we've seen some progress in some countries on, you know, restoring biodiversity, on reducing climate 
emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I read somewhere recently, and it's only about 100 corporations responsible for 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. This is a manageable problem if we put our will to it. Uh, and public ownership solutions uh, enable the state to play a much bigger role in deciding where our energy dollars go and, and where our energy comes from. And we've done it before. Uh, we've harnessed you know, public dollars to back public energy in a period of wartime when all resources needed to be harnessed to a war effort. We have to consider this a war effort. And then this question of, you know, how do we persuade people? I come back to where we began. You know, LGBT people know that you don't wait for someone's approval to fall in love. You know, you don't wait for someone's, for the environment to be legal to come out. Like we were all, at least I was, and I, you know, some of us are old enough, I think, to have been out before it was quote unquote legal to get married. Well, so what? You know, that we did it anyway. And 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 think of the desegregation rules around multi racial marriages. Uh, we have to act as if that we're living in the world that we want to be living in. Um, and I think we have to act as if on the climate change, as if we can do this differently and demand of our officials at whatever level that they make the changes that are required. The obstacles are huge. On this one, we need federal power, um, but we can make the change at the local level, like the communities of for example, Boulder, Colorado, that have repeatedly um, passed ballot initiatives seizing from their local utility power, meaning taking over the local utility because it had been dragging its feet on transitioning to renewables. They've been up against no end of legal challenges, and this route is not easy, but people can act. And I think that that's, you know, we've had revolutions before around the environment and the economy, I think of, you know, what it took to electrify rural America. It took cooperation, literally co-ops, um, to bring those electrical power, the electrical grids and, the, and the, 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 the lines to a lot of Appalachia and the Southeast. Um, we're doing it now around broadband, having local communities pledge to um, own their own uh, municipal broadband because the corporations are either charging too much and not providing services to poor people or the community as a whole if it's too small. You know, again, our show tries to show, yes, we're in this big mess. B, it's not immutable. C, there are people making change. And D, if we got more people behind this kind of change, it could have the sort of systemic effect that affects um, the, the macro picture. Um, but it's going to take time and those multiple generations if we are lucky enough to have them. We were talking before the program about people who get targeted by the president or his partisans yeah. on whatever issue is kind of a good football for him to kind of play with at the moment. Um, have you ever experienced that? I mean, you deal with lots of hot button issues. Uh, and how did you deal with it if you did? We, you know, you don't want to remind people of the times that you were attacked. <laughs> there was a great no, moment where I got give, to go. We're not giving the, ideas. <laughs> there was a great moment where I got to sit next to Andrew Breitbart on the Bill Maher show and stick it to him. He died soon after, but I don't think I was responsible. Um, but I got a lot of hate for that. Um, you know, I think right now my thoughts go out to Kim Crenshaw, Kimberly Crenshaw, UCLA and Columbia Law School Center for Intersectionality, the whole school of critical race theory that she's been a part of. And she herself um, are being targeted by the president um, who is banning critical race studies or anything having to do with the teaching of white supremacy uh, in any government program to public employees and any public money going to programs that use that sort of lens uh, across the country. Never have we needed the work of Kimberly Crenshaw and critical race theorists like Robin D.G. Kelly and others more than at this moment to help us understand how to unravel um, the racist economy that we're living in, which is, in, you know, in born in uh, not just appropriation of land and genocide of people, but the commodification of people. Um, and this is something when we talk about changing our priorities, and I know I'm going off topic here, um, but if we don't start realizing that our economy is based on prioritizing profit over people up into and including and based on the commodification of actual human beings, 
and that we need to change to an economy that is prioritizing care, prevention, and the well-being of the people who live in this society. If we don't get that message right here, right now, um, I don't know when we're ever going to get it. And maybe we are doomed. And maybe I am a pessimist after all, but I don't like to think so. Um, and Kim is a, is a dear friend, but I, I hate to see, you know, it's often the case that we have these discussions about the political debate without attaching people um, and the, what they are going through. Um, and there are real people being really targeted right now. And we don't have to wait for 50 years to tell the story of the Hollywood 10 and what happened to people under red baiting. It's happening right here, right now. And with our new reporting capacity, um, we can talk about it and we can bring those people to the fore so that it's not so abstract when the president says the kind of horrendous and hate-filled things that he says. It's not so abstract, the impact. It's real on, on real living people with flesh and blood. I have a couple stories or uh, topics right now that inspire me that don't keep me. Okay, up good. We're going to yeah. have some, some, some light <laughs> levity now. Sorry about that. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> right before the, the shelter in place or the pandemic uh, affected us here in the Bay Area, um, our I think one of our last live programs, John, was with Christian Picciolini, who's out there. Uh, you know, as an advocate, a former white supremacist who's really, you know, driving change, educating people on these extremist groups and how they operate. Uh, and so, you know, I think that he's being incredibly effective in talking to many families, families with young folks who are on the internet all day long and being sucked in by these, these kinds of uh, groups. I, he's an inspiration to me. And then there's young people, um, you know, around the world who are fighting for freedom, like the folks, the umbrella movement in Hong Kong or the whistleblowers, um, just, just a recent story, the whistleblower, the nurse, uh, you know, who called attention to the doctor performing those uh, hysterectomies on, on the women in the detention center. And, and, and a lot of the, actually a, a huge uh, inspiration from many advocates and activists who are doing so much in the immigration um, uh, you know, asylum uh, border situation of this very dangerous time in, in the United States with regards to that. Those are the types of change makers who are really driving me to say, yes, every day you have to wake up and you have to keep telling these stories. And I know that the Laura Flanders show, I mean, that that, that is the, the base of it is, you know, being inspired by these change makers and bringing those types of stories to the forefront what stories inspire you and what can we expect, you know, coming up um, this season of your new program? Oh, there's so many, you know, we have 26 shows coming up. So if you really want to keep abreast of what is inspiring me and get inspired yourself, you should go to the Laura Flanders website. That's lauraflanders.org and sign up for our newsletter. So then you'll know ahead of time what we have coming up, but I'll give you a sneak peek. Um, again, this week, very exciting. We're profiling this new community street team, people who have no reason to have any inclination to work with their local police force, people who've spent years inside on um, criminal charges who have been treated horrendously by our so-called criminal justice system and yet come out. I'm thinking of Darren Darden, who came out and Damon Darden and, and, and became one of the leaders of this organization that's all about not just giving people like himself a second chance, but giving the whole policing system a second chance, um, which is to say being willing to participate in training police in crime prevention and in working with public safety officers, meaning people in the police world, um, to change the priorities and the spending habits of that department of local government. Um, is it abolition? No, but it is incredibly inspiring work that's also speaking about speaking to the need to invest in the local economy of the community so that somebody like Damon coming out of school today has some options other than simply um, being, you know, brought into the, to the so-called gang world, the youth organization world. Um, he inspires me and the young woman, um, Brianna Taylor on that, Brianna um, Smith on that show um, uh, inspires me. I'm also inspired by the reporters. I, I mentioned Brianna Taylor by accident, but the reporters, um, uh, like Yoruba Richin, who's been reporting on the case of the Breonna Taylor uh, killing uh, for the New York Times, a filmmaker, award-winning filmmaker who we've had on the show and who actually appears on the show in a couple of weeks as part of something called the Economic Hardship Reporting Project. 
um, which gives resources to reporters to cover this massively undercovered story, which is poverty in America. Um, stories like that, organizations like Push Buffalo that we feature in a few weeks that are helping address the challenge of gentrification, guaranteeing that Yes, communities can change, but let's have the people who live in those communities be part of that change. And how can we see reinvestment in, you know, downtrodden, underserved communities, help the people who live there now and who have kept them alive. And they do direct hands-on training of people who are in danger of being evicted so that they can bring their own houses and the houses of people around them up to scratch and even develop a green renovation company, community-owned, cooperatively-owned, that is now um, not just a powerhouse when it comes to uh, contracting in the Buffalo area and in terms of green energy and, and green energy efficiency housing, but even in politics in the community as they start to think about running some of those folks um, for office. There's a wonderful young woman in that show who says, you know, we've been very successful at persuading politicians through our collective organizing, um, but what if our collectives were the politicians? What if we ran for office? And she's part of uh, a community land trust and is now, I think, as we speak, thinking about running for office next time in her town. So, again, I'm inspired by people who, who have kind of no reason to invest as much as they do and every reason to opt out and say, eh. um, but instead recommit um, and in their stories bring a whole lot of people with them and a whole different model of how you be a leader. It's not about celebrity. It's not about um, making the gazillions. It's about changing life for the better. Um, right here and now um, in the world that you live in and the people you care about. I'm, I'm glad Michelle brought up Christian Piccolini um, because one of the things he said actually kind of was echoed what you were talking about with the Biden people going, should be going Not door going. to door. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> because what he, Piccolini has, uh, I think he says he's helped like 300 people get out of and leave these white supremacist groups. And you know, we asked him, so it's like, how do you do that? <laughs> what do you say to them? Do you are, you know, and he said, I, it's, I don't talk race with them. I don't talk, you know, how could you believe this? He doesn't yell at them. And it's like, I talk to them, like, what's going on in your life? What do you need? What do you, you know, what are you dealing with all the time? And uh, I, 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 you know, that kind of connecting with what you were talking about, the Biden should be doing yeah. um, does kind of suggest well Go ahead. It, yeah. No, it goes back to coming out, doesn't it? I mean, you know, what we did when what we do every time we come out is to say, hi, here I am. Let's talk. You have some idea of who I am, but actually here I am. And what do you, you know, let's engage in a conversation. And I think in a sense, that's what we're also doing on our show in that we're introducing people to people. I think that's my entire job. Um, uh, introducing people to people they might not have thought of as the expert, um, maybe the grassroots group, woman of color, environmental activist in Louisiana, um, who has information that might save your life, or the, you know, Inuit activist who's been watching what's happening in Alaska might have information that might save your life. Uh, you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, oh, maybe these LGBT, you know, we did a story once about, again, a gentrification project in um, Berlin in part of the very fast developing formerly Eastern section of that city. And the Turkish, mostly Muslim community of immigrants who were living in public housing about to be gentrified, which is to say taken out of their reach economically, um, were helped to have their meetings in a restaurant that was in the forecourt, the sort of um, pedestrian zone forecourt at the base of this public housing project. And the restaurant was owned by a gay male couple who were very out and very active in the gay community, but they didn't hammer the heads of these, um, some of them very regressive in their social views, Turkish Muslim anti-gentrification fighters. They simply provided them great food, a great place to have their meeting. And they were very clear about who they were and their solidarity and their role in the struggle. And obviously, you know, soon became very evident to those Turkish activists and many of them realized, oh, we have common cause here and we've actually been wrong in some of our assumptions. But it's like you said, it's like, do you come in with a bulldozer or, you know, with a, with a, you know, cookie, you know, 
the, the great um, feminist, black feminist, um, I'm trying to think now, I'll think of it in a second. Uh, the woman who said, you know, what would you rather see come through the door, one lion or a million mouse, a million mice? Um, uh, Flo Kennedy. Flo Kennedy, I think, was right. But you come in with a million mice, some of them super, you know, super sexy and offering treats. Um, not with the big, scary lion, perhaps. But I don't yeah. remember where your question began. Sorry. Flo Kennedy. <laughs> that, that went in a great direction. Well, I, I saw on your, your website you, you uh, interviewed one of our favorite guests on the Michelle Miao show in the uh, past few years, and that's Dolores Huerta. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, just... A true uh, national treasure. And, and so clear-eyed about how to go about organizing and, and pursuing things and, and such. But what I'm asking you, you've obviously talked to a lot of interesting people, both people who are not known as well as people like her who, who have been known for decades. Um, is there anyone you have not been able to interview? Who's your, you know, the, the, your, your Ahab, who's your great white whale? Ooh, you wish you could ooh that's such a great question. Dang. Well, I'd kind of like to interview Michelle Obama. Um, and um, well, I have kind of a long list. I'd like, at the moment, I'm very interested in interviewing the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Um, uh, you know, I can, I can work up quite a list. Ava DuVernay, we've never had on the show. Um, but can I talk about Huerta for a second? Because that show sure. that she's on is so inspiring also. You know, we talk about this moment in the... the I, I watched the other day J.P. Morgan, an ad by J.P. Morgan. It appeared on, you know, the pre-roll of some video I was watching. And they were like, volatility is also opportunity, you know. And there should be no doubt in our minds that for many people, the volatility of this moment is an opportunity for venture capital um to vulture capital, really, to, to swoop in and seize our assets, um, such as we have them. Uh, the flip side of that, though, is the story that, that, that we interviewed Dolores about, which is the agricultural shift that's happening as, sure, there's a lot of volatility with family farms passing into the hands of people who are um, well, you know, aging out, family farmers aging out, their kids don't want to take over, different generation, different culture, they don't want to be farmers. So there's a possibility we could lose the last of our family farms to agribusiness. And I think this is a model you're going to see playing out with small businesses all across the country as they talk about the silver tsunami of, of family-owned business. And the episode that we spoke to Dolores for was one about how farm workers, many of them immigrant workers who've been working those fields, are themselves um, either helped or, or, or not enabled to take over those farms. And what it takes to help those workers become owners themselves. And in, and in return, what they would bring to our food supply, um, the style of work on the farm, um, to our agricultural basis. Uh, and it's actually a very upbeat story. Some things as simple as could the ag department just print things in Spanish? <laughs> and could we have more credit unions that support small um, cooperatives of um, collectives of, of uh, potential owners to buy. You know, not complicated stuff, stuff that's been traditional in migrant communities and black communities, indigenous communities, pooling resources, reducing risk, spreading the chance around, um, but needs federal support. And in this moment, I think people are relearning how valuable some of those local networks are. Um, you don't want all your food coming from far away any more than you want all your news uh, coming from a long distance. Uh, we need to know what's happening right here where we live. We, we kind of keep going back to uh, the, the president and a presidential candidate. And so it is one of my, my questions. I wanted to know how important this election is to you. Very. Need to know more? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I feel like such a cliche saying it's the most important election of our lifetime. But it really is. I mean, that whole sentence is now a cliche, but it really is the most important election of our lifetime. Um, and there's a lot of things we need to do in addition to vote, but we have to vote. And if person, if possible in person, 
if necessary, um, absentee, but do it right now if you possibly can. Make sure you're signed up. And then make sure that everybody you know is signed up to vote. Take people to the polls. Make sure that they have, particularly those who are immunity def deficient or, you know, immunity deprived or vulnerable health, uh, uh, health condition, help them to figure out how they're going to cast that vote. Um, and if they need a ride that is safe, offer that ride. Uh, there's a lot of things people can do. Um, and I think we have to learn, again, another part of the world, that another you know part of our community that we learn from a lot on the show is the community um, fighting for disability justice, who have kind of pioneered how do you create a part of people that care and that understand what your needs are and that can help meet those needs, maybe not individually, but as a group. So, you know, learn from the disability community. Uh, it's a very complicated way of answering your question, but I think you get my point. Like, how do we need to help one another to cast this vote? Um, because I do believe our lives depend on it. Are we going to have a society purely run for the profit of a few, specifically the president and his family, and driven by race and gender politics that will take us back a century? Or are we going to have the kind of leadership that we movements can push to change priorities and to shift our society towards one that um, cares more about more people and spreads more of our collective wealth around. That's what we're looking at. And the climate crisis just puts a fine point on it. Really, are we going to live or die? I, I do think this election is about that. And you'll be voting. I certainly will. You know, I am. I'm a dual citizen. My That's father was British, but my now. mother was American. So okay. I will legally vote for the umpteenth time. Um, and I won't be doing what Donald Trump is advising his people to do, which is to vote twice. As a dual citizen, were you that from the start or did you have to like apply? For I was lucky at that time in the 60s when I was born. Um, Way back in the 60s, you could have double, you could have dual citizenship uh, if your mother, you know, depending on, on who your forebears were, your parents. And my mother was American. My father was British. I'm mid-Atlantic like that. <laughs> I could probably vote on some mid-Atlantic election too, but I don't know what that would be. Uh, you know, this work you know, at times, um, we can all say it's a labor of love, but at times, um, sometimes you know, it's thankless or it, or many people nowadays are very grateful for truth tellers. Um, but we all have to take care of ourselves and make sure that we're, we're, we're living, we're healthy, we're, you know, we're, we're able to keep going. So how do you take care of yourself? How do you de detach from yourself when you need to from some of the most intense, you know, stories that you're, you're talking about? Well, I'm lucky enough to be partners with an action hero. Um, Elizabeth Streb is the um, action architect choreographer behind the Streb Extreme Action Company, which some of you may have heard of. And they literally fly in the air. They dive through glass. They leap off trampolines. Um, she had a ton of dirt drop on her at one point. She, her company and Slam, the place that they work out of in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, offer always an opportunity for me to go and watch people do the impossible, hurtle into the floor at high speeds um, and get up having got perfect technique and not having injured themselves to live and do something incredible another day. Now they're not performing live right now because of the pandemic, but they are, per are performing online. You can follow uh, Streb and social media. Uh, she didn't ask me to plug her, but truly I, I couldn't be more. I, I mean, I'm the luckiest person in the world and the, the people I interview for my work inspire me. And then when I get down in the dumps, I can go and watch this amazing action that reminds me that, you know, you move hearts. It's important that we move hearts as well as minds. And that sometimes, you know, that that move that takes your breath away is as important as worrying about your next breath. Um, yeah, sometimes I just need to get over myself. <laughs> Self-care is sometimes just saying, don't worry so much about myself. Well, let's talk fair? about some of the Don't work too hard, but work really hard. <laughs> I, I do think we have to work. I don't know if there was never a time that we needed to work hard. I, I guess I am old school and I, I don't self-care very well, but I'm very healthy. My grandmother survived the flu of 1911. She had it and she survived it. And I believe her genes have got me this far. Um, and actually both Elizabeth and I had COVID earlier in the year, um, but we came out. 
It's very serious. It's important. Don't not wear your mask. But we can do this. Um, as June Jordan said, you know, one of her important essays was titled, you know, Some of Us Did Not Die. And it was written after 9-11. You know, some of us are not dead yet. So let's not act like we are. Talk a bit, if you will, share your uh, your spotlight here with the team you have producing the Laura Flanders show. Oh, how, please. How, well, I, I wish I could. How did you assemble the team and how are you dealing, I assume, a lot of remote stuff as well with them during these times? Well, they, they are here, um, you know, in my arms here. A, a wonderful team, not very large. There's just eight of us. Matt Colicello, our creative director. Jeremiah Cothran, our communications director. Nat Needham, Charlotte Carpenter, our editors. Um, Jeannie Hopper, our amazing audio director. Ryan Holtz, our research reporter. Sabrina Artel has come on in the last six months as my producing and booking um, colleague, assistant. Um, she lives near where I've been staying. Elizabeth and I have been staying in upstate New York. We're lucky enough to be able to get out and go live in a little summer cabin that I'm a bit worried about in winter, but I'm sure we'll make it through. Um, and she and I worked closely together on a really charming episode of the show that you'll see later this year, actually on October the 6th, called COVID in the Country, um, where we went along, went all around a, a small town and rural community of Sullivan County. And I did reporting. I sort of figured out how I could do reporting with a very long selfie stick and my mask and be socially distanced from my subject. And um, Sabrina and I worked that out together. So that's just an example of how we're learning. We now have one extraordinarily wonderful social media um, producer, Mercedes Graciago, who's working with us from France because of the way that Donald Trump's immigration policies have changed her ability to, to live here legally and to renew her, her visa. Um, so, you know, we're responding and dealing with a lot of challenges. And I think we've all been through a lot. And when you talked about self-care, I'm not that great at that, but I am very, I'm very concerned that all of us are working so hard and we maybe, you know, present company included, are we taking enough time to realize just how many different pressures we're under? I mean, where you are, you're dealing with the climate crisis up front, but we're all also dealing with our policing system out of control, with a patriarchy that's out of control. You mentioned that story, Michelle, that's been so shocking about um, forced sterilization of our detainees. That goes back in history over centuries, and it's horrendous to see it raising its head. Um, we're all dealing with a lot in addition to the pandemic. Uh, and so we try in our company to spend a little bit of time every week, at least just checking in with how one another is. And we've learned to be very flexible to deal with people's you know, physical situation, where they're working, and their um, often extended family situation, the people they're looking after or worrying about. I can't believe it, but we've already spent an hour with you, Laura, and I could listen to your stories uh, all day long. And I'm glad that, you know, now we can, we can watch your show weekly and that's available on PBS, right? Yeah. You can find the show premieres every Sunday, 1130 AM on PBS world channel. Many of your local stations carry the world channel, or you can find it online. We're also premiering Sundays on our YouTube channel. So just look for the Laura Flanders show on YouTube, L-A-U-R-A-F-L-A-N-D-E-R-S. Um, and then the show, having premiered on the Sunday, plays on public television stations all across the country in the in the days and weeks to come. And you can find the full lineup um, there at um, at our website, lauraflanders.org. Laura, thank you so much again for joining us, and congratulations on uh, all your work and the, the new show. Well, congratulations to you, Michelle and John. Thank you for showing flexibility at the Commonwealth Club and out there in the universe. It's been wonderful to be with you. Thanks for having me. We're doing all we can, and thank you for joining <laughs> us for the, this program. And I'm so proud of the club in being able to provide over 200 virtual programs, most of them free. And so support the work of the club if you can. More programs coming up here on the Michelle Miao Show. We're going to try to get you some, some good stuff uh, as we head into the election. So make sure you check out commonwealthclub.org slash MMS for the full programs. And I'm going to leave it to John for the last word. 
Oh, I was going to send everyone to moralclub.org slash MMS. So I'll just reiterate that. Thank you again, Laura. Thank you, Michelle. And thanks everyone joining us both live and following us on our podcast and our YouTube channel.